Welcome to Reading for Your Life. This is Alex, and if you haven't heard previous episodes, I'm nothing special. Just a guy with a bookshelf who wants to share books that have had an impact on my life. This month, I want to share Randy Pausch's The Last Lecture. Now, this is a tough one, because I suspect a lot of people have already come across it. The book was published in 2008 and remained on the New York Times bestseller list for 48 weeks. It's since been translated into 28 languages and has sold over 5 million copies in just the U.S. But I chose this book because I love its message and its lessons. As I record this, it's about six days to the winter solstice, the longest night of the year. All over the world, some of the most beloved festivals have sprung up in this dark and cold time. We gather together to share food and warmth and candlelight. This year, I think it's important to remember what's most important in life, and this is a great book for those lessons. This book is ultimately a summation and a continuation of a lecture that Dr. Pausch gave at Carnegie Mellon University in 2007 called Really Achieving Your Childhood Dreams. The lecture was given as part of their Journeys series, formerly called Last Lectures, which is a not uncommon theme at various universities. If you Google Last Lectures, you can find similar series at the University of Oklahoma, Loyola, and Monmouth. Professors are asked to consider what their advice would be if they only had one lecture left to give. The video of the talk, still on YouTube, has nearly 20 million views today. If you haven't seen the lecture or read the book, I highly recommend both. I first found the book entirely by accident. I was lucky enough to have the opportunity to participate in a summer study abroad program in college. So in the summer of 2008, when this book was released, I had spent about a month living in a small Tuscan hill town in Italy. Now, the fact that I have a podcast about books probably tells you that I'm a pretty voracious reader. So when I travel, I usually carry a book or two with me. The problem with long flights, like, say, seven hours to Europe, is that I almost always finish whatever I've brought along. I don't remember the exact timing, but at some point in the trip, I found myself in one of the larger cities, probably Rome and decided to stop by a bookstore for something new to read. I know what you're thinking, and yes, almost everything was in Italian. My Italian isn't even passable on a conversational level, so I'm not exactly proficient in any kind of reading level. Thankfully, the bookstore had a small English language section, and in it, prominently displayed, was the last lecture by Randy Pausch. I knew nothing more than I liked the little rocket ship on the cover, and that the sticker on the front said it was a bestseller, so I bought it. The book's a pretty easy read and not really that long, so I devoured it. In the years since, I've told so many people about it, and I've even lent my own copy out multiple times, which I've almost never had returned, which makes this one of the few books on my shelf for which I've bought multiple copies. Before we get to the talk itself, let me give a little bit more background on Dr. Randy Pausch. Here's the bio given at the end of the book. Randy Pausch was a professor of computer science, human-computer integration, and design at Carnegie Mellon University. From 1988 to 1997, he taught at the University of Virginia. An award-winning teacher and researcher, he worked with Adobe, Google, Electronic Arts, and Walt Disney Imagineering, and he pioneered the Alice Project. If you dig a little deeper, you find his reach and influence were substantial even before his viral rise to fame. Pausch authored the World Book Encyclopedia entry for virtual reality, and I recently read Jaron Lanier's Dawn of the New Everything in which he remembers Pausch as a contributor in the early VR community. You may not know that Lanier literally coined the phrase virtual reality, so featuring in his retelling of the birth of that nascent technology is no small thing. If you listen to a few last lectures, people tend to espouse big ideas, which is no surprise. If you've only got one opportunity left to say something, you'd make sure that it was something important. Randy Pausch's last lecture is no different. To get more into the lecture itself, I want to bounce between the lecture and the book here, since they contain slightly different information. For the lecture, Dr. Pausch wanted to distill whatever wisdom he had to pass on in the time frame that he was given, which was about an hour. In the book, he takes us a little bit more behind the scenes of what preparing for the lecture was like, and we learn a little bit more about his family. I know I'd be intimidated if I was asked to distill whatever wisdom I had to give into a pithy one hour talk. Dr. Pausch wanted to provide whatever unique advice he had to share into something informative, interesting, and lasting. He finally realized that the things that he loved the most about his life and his most proud accomplishments were things that were rooted in the dreams from his childhood. Starting with a list of his childhood dreams, things like being in zero gravity, working at Disney, playing in the NFL, and being Captain Kirk, 
he started to build his life story in PowerPoint format. That went about like you'd expect if you were to try to boil your entire life down to a single presentation. Some several hundred slides later, he realized he had entirely too much to cover. He managed to cut that back to a still very robust 280 slides. He was still editing the day of the talk, but he managed to put together a narrative arc that still brings me to tears every time I watch it. The talk breaks into a great number of life lessons. Each taken individually, they're good reminders of foundational ways to build a good life, and taken together, they're the distillation of much hard-won wisdom. The book reminds me a lot of my family. There are distant relatives, my great-grandfather, for instance, that I only know through bite-sized tales. When he was young, he decided to visit every state in the Union, a feat that he eventually managed, and he had quite a few adventures along the way. He worked fitting propellers on steamboats on the Mississippi, laid train tracks with the Mexican Railroad, shot alligators clearing the Everglades, and built dams with the TVA. The stories from his life that still survive often have nuggets of wisdom that my family and I still relish in sharing with one another. One of my favorites is that about halfway through his tour of the States, he met a girl. They fell in love, and he told her that he'd set out to see every state, and he had to do it before he settled down. Reluctantly, they parted ways, and he set out to finish his adventure, which, as I said before, he did. But afterwards, he went right back to her, and she became my great-grandmother. Though I never met Pop, I feel like I know something important about him from that story. A lesson about finishing what you start and about knowing where home really is. That's what Dr. Pouch was setting out to accomplish with his lecture. To tell the stories that would resonate with others through the years. And there's a wonderful practicality that you find as he begins to tell these stories. Remember that Dr. Pouch was an engineer. That means he's interested in very practical solutions to any problem that he sees. A great example is with his first childhood dream floating in zero gravity. Because he'd worn glasses as a kid, he was pretty sure he wouldn't cut it as an astronaut. But years down the line, as a professor, he discovered that there was a collegiate competition for university students to submit science experiments to NASA. Should they win, the team could take a ride on NASA's reduced gravity aircraft, appropriately nicknamed the Vomit Comet. The plane flies up and down in parabolic arcs, meaning that for each cycle, there's a short period of near weightlessness. Dr. Pausch assembled his student team and helped them put together their proposal, and lo and behold, they won. Of course, their team and their advisor, Dr. Pausch, were ecstatic. Except for one small hurdle, NASA informed the team that academic advisors were not invited along for the ride. Here's where we get one of the first solid life lessons. Brick walls are there to let us prove how badly we want things. The barriers to entry are there to keep the people who don't want it badly enough out. Dr. Pausch quickly came up with a very personal plan to overcome this particular brick wall. Buried in the competition rules, he discovered that while faculty advisors weren't invited, the team could include a local media correspondent. Thankfully, he'd done a little bit of writing for a few websites, and he quickly faxed over his application for the journalist spot on the team. He made a good case for how they would integrate VR into the experience and enrich the event for the other teams as well. NASA bit, and he earned his ride into zero-g. In the telling of the story, we get a lesson about the purpose of brick walls, which I love. It reminds me of Chris Gethard's privilege of backbreaking work that we talked about a few months ago. Those barriers that we come up against are simply an opportunity for us to push harder, to learn, to grow, and to make sure we really want what we're after. But we also get an infinitely practical lesson in the importance of bringing something to the table. It would have been easy enough for Dr. Pausch to pitch a fit about not being included in the flight. Perhaps even easier to send in the journalist application and hope that someone at NASA was feeling merciful. Instead, he looked at what he could offer that would make NASA not only reluctantly accept, but want to say yes. He found a way to enrich the experience overall and even offer better PR for NASA by integrating a larger VR component. He brought something valuable to the table and he made the answer that he wanted easier to give. His next story is about playing professional football. That's a common and substantial dream, and for him, and for many, it wasn't really realistic. But in the pursuit of the dream, even at an early age, he learned lessons that would last him a lifetime. He talks about a coach that he had during his little league years, Coach Graham. At the first practice, the boys are all crowded around and suddenly realize that there's not footballs on the field. They ask the coach how they're supposed to practice without any footballs. The coach responds with a question of his own. 
How many players are on a football field at a time? The kids think and they respond. 22, 11 per side. And how many are holding the football in any given moment, he says. They think again and they reply. Only one. That's right, he says. So we're going to work on what the other 21 players should be doing. What a great lesson for a kid to hear. How often do we talk about the incredible skill of the breakout star, the one running to the end zone and making three-pointers, but it takes the whole team to win the game? The best quarterback in the world can't win alone. Someone has to play defense. Someone has to block. Multiple players doing the fundamentals well, reliably, time and time again, is what makes for a championship team. The fundamentals are what make the big plays possible. Another great lesson that comes from his early football days is that of the head fake. In football terms, a head fake is a technique for throwing off an opponent. If they're watching your eyes and you move your head in a certain direction, the opponent's instinct is to move in the same direction to head you off. If you move your head purposefully in the wrong direction, the opponent may go left and you go right. Now, if you've ever played a contact sport, you'll know that the solution is to watch the player's hips. Wherever their waist goes, the rest of them's going too. But the other head fake that Dr. Pelsch took away is more metaphorical. We find it in the life lessons that Coach Graham built into workaday football drills. Lessons about perseverance and pushing through adversity. Lessons about hard work and dedication to a thing that you care about. In learning those lessons, Randy was simply a kid playing a game. But by the end, he looked around and realized that he'd been learning something important the whole time. There's such a range of stories in the lecture. From Randy's wife, Jay, accidentally crashing one of their cars into the other one of their cars, we learn a lesson about the unimportance of material things. In a story about a student who barely earned their way into a program by sending a simple thank you note to someone who had no power to help them, but when that note came up during their evaluation, it made all the difference. We learn about gratitude as a matter of character. And there are great quotes galore. Things like, hard work is like compound interest in the bank. The rewards build faster. Or, people are more important than things. Or how about, you can always change your plans, but only if you have one. There are little pearls of wisdom peppered throughout the book, enough to make you pause and think. But here's where I should stop and fess up to something very important that I've left out so far. Randy Pausch was dying. In 2006, Randy had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. He was relatively young and otherwise healthy, so he underwent aggressive treatment with a lot of hope. But in August 2007, he was told that the cancer had reappeared and that he only had three to six months of good health remaining. There was only a 5% chance that he would be alive in five years. I can't imagine what it's like to receive that news. In his telling, the nurse left him and his wife Jay alone in the hospital room. Randy, seeing his records pulled up on the computer, decided to take a look for himself. And when he found the scans, his only comment was, My goose is cooked. He proceeded to count the tumors and was soon in double digits. He'd been invited to give the speech before those scans, so he faced a difficult choice on what to do next. Ultimately, he decided to give the speech. He readily talks about how difficult that decision was for both him and for his family, both the decision to give the speech and the whole process of preparing. His wife, Jay, also wrote about her experience of this time in her book, Dream New Dreams, Reimagining My Life After Loss. There's nothing to say but that it was difficult. There was limited time left and plans had to be made for how to care for Jay and the kids after his passing. Randy had aggressive treatments to prolong his time as much as possible. And with young kids and Randy struggling with his disease, there were difficulties of all kinds. But what I'm touched by most is how brightly the things that are important in life shone through for Randy at the end. Dr. Pausch had self-confidence in spades. It's evident when you hear him speak, and more importantly, it was something that he recognized in himself. That can rub some people the wrong way. There were critics then and even now who say he shouldn't have pursued the public lecture after learning of his diagnosis, much less followed up with opportunities that came after, including a Diane Sawyer interview, a book deal, or Oprah. Because Dr. Pausch outlived his initial diagnosis, there were even conspiracy theorists that questioned whether he was really sick to begin with. Independent doctors had to verify his diagnosis to try to silence the doubters. But of course, he eventually did succumb to the disease, just over a year after his three- to six-month prognosis. When I think about the fact that he outlived that estimate by less than a year, that doesn't seem like much time at all. But it was enough for the cynics in our world to question a dying man's story. 
I think there has to be more to it than ego. After all, how does one fuel one's ego when one is nearly certain that the end is nigh? The death of the ego is a common concept in Jungian psychology and certain Eastern religions. Some people even take psychedelics to induce the experience of ego loss, that is, the complete breakdown of that sense of self. When I think about receiving a terminal diagnosis, I can imagine my own ego responding in two very different ways. The first is utter and complete war against the inevitable. Death is the ultimate ego ender. We're all going to die one day. But putting a deadline in the near future to the end of yourself is serious business. Denial would be so much easier. Anger would feel justified. Doing anything and everything to stave off a death sentence would be perfectly reasonable and sane. But the other response is what we see from Dr. Pausch. Acceptance. Not enjoyment or revelry. He made it very clear that he'd trade his disease for just about any other. And he was more than open to whatever course of treatment might make a difference. He wanted to be the one in a million that beat the disease, joking with his oncologist that he hoped to one day be on the brochure for the practice. But how many of us, if given three to six months left to live, would accept the end well enough to use the last good health that we had to spread a message passing on what we'd learned about living a good life? He still made time for his family. He planned with his wife for the inevitable end, making difficult decisions that would see his family supported and safe after he was gone. He traveled with his kids, building memories that would hopefully make it through that childhood threshold and still be with them as adults. He made videos of himself playing with his children so that they could look back at the relationship they'd had with their father. He wrote for them and left them memories to unpack as they grew older. But he knew that he'd be gone. He never had the chance for the serious talks that many parents share with their children. A heartfelt discussion at a late-night dinner table. Sage wisdom the night before a wedding. He'd be gone. And as hard as it is for each of us to believe, the world would keep turning without him, as it will one day continue turning without each of us. All that remains is the imprint that we make on those who remember us. We invest our time in one another to create ripples in their lives. Those ripples can be positive, reaching out from your family and friends into joy and goodness in the world. Or they can be negative, resentment and anger spreading like waves in a quiet sea. Dr. Pausch wanted to continue teaching his children after he was gone. His wife's book shows us another powerful view of the same story we hear in the last lecture. Gone are any doubts of an unreliable narrator or self-aggrandizement. Jay tells us about their early relationship watching Randy as a father to their children, from his fierce love and protection of their kids to his playful streak demonstrated by his fondness for making animal pancakes, to his puckish streak exemplified in playful pranks that he and the kids would play on Jay, a game she remembers as Scare the Mommy. But we also get an incredible view behind the scenes of one of the most stressful things that can happen in one's life. As Jay comments in her book, There's nothing scarier than hearing you have cancer, unless it's your loved one has cancer. The perfect life that they'd begun building together, a home, three children in five years, even participating together in a local sports league, it all ended when their doctor gave them the diagnosis of pancreatic cancer. To announce the situation to their family, Randy sent an email. He wanted to share with everyone at once to assure them that he'd be doing anything and everything that he could to fight the disease, and that he and Jay had planned for every eventuality that they could. There were savings, a home for the family, life insurance, and systems in place to ensure that Jay had every form of resource going forward that could be planned for. But what Randy asked for was support for his family when he was gone. He already knew that Jay was a superhero mom and did an incredible job as a caregiver for him as his disease worsened, and for their children. But he knew that the emotional support of family was the last vitally important piece of the puzzle. In her book, Jay shares his email. It's to the point, direct. He lays out the facts honestly and earnestly, and is realistic about both his chances and the challenges that the family will surely face. Again, I'm stunned by his courage in the moment. Think about how easy it would be to crumble in the face of a death sentence. Even for the world's greatest optimist, facing one's own mortality may be the hardest possible ask. 
We'll talk more about that in February when we share Atul Gawande's Being Mortal. It's touching to me to know that facing this most difficult choice, Dr. Pausch's biggest concern is how to care for everyone and everything that he had touched. There were obviously his children and his wife, but he'd built a community of people that relied on him. Research teams and students, projects at various universities and organizations for the common good. And as he faced the end, his concern was how to build the best road for all of it. To leave something for his children to remember him. To ensure that his wife was cared for. As we return to the lecture, those stories make even more sense. In the end, Dr. Pausch tells us that it's all one big head fake. While we've been absorbing bite-sized anecdotes and life lessons, he's been building something for the children that he'll soon leave behind. It was never for us. It was for them. As I gather with my own family over the next few weeks, I'll be thinking about what's most important. I'll be thinking about the things that last and how, how many things unfortunately don't. We're all fortunate to have the time that we do. Time to make our impressions on one another, pass along our wisdom, and build beautiful lives together. Dr. Pausch's co-author Jeffrey Zaslow said of Randy, His fate is ours, sped up. Randy's time was precious, and so is ours. Use it to pursue your dreams and to enable the dreams of others. As Randy said himself, time is all you have, and you may one day find you have less of it than you think. Thanks for listening to this episode of Reading for Your Life. In January, we'll kick off 2020 with Yuval Noah Harari's 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. As we look forward to the new year and what's to come, it's a great introduction to big questions that face our world. I hope you'll subscribe to the podcast or drop me a line on social media at Alex P. Acton on Instagram and Twitter. Tell me what you think of the show, tell me what's important in your life, or recommend a book that's taught you something important. Or you can keep up with future shows at Modern Polymaths on Twitter and at Modern Polymaths Media on Facebook. Until next month, thank you so much for listening. Keep reading, and I wish you the best life imaginable.